Adolf Hitler and Michelangelo Buonarroti. Actually, we should flip that around. Hitler's probably the world's most famous failure and should always be listed last. So, Michelangelo Buonarroti and Adolf Hitler. Two men who had more in common than you might think. Both had bad tempers. And, okay, that's probably where the similarities end. You see, Michelangelo is one of the most acclaimed artists of all time. The man who poured his entire being into stone and coaxed life from marble. Then the other was an artistic reject who transformed into an immensely unattractive, malfunctioning Roomba, sucking up artistic treasures all across Europe. This is the tale of a divinely inspired genius's very first sculpture, vanished from the pages of history. A piece so valuable, there's still a reward for information on its whereabouts. This is a tale of feuds, a tale of rejection, a tale of war. A tale of masks, madness, and methamphetamine. This is Firenze. Well, we call it Florence. Italians call it Firenze, which sounds a whole lot cooler to me. I'd like to call it that myself, but unfortunately I've yet to find a way of doing so without sounding pretentious. For a time, Florence could be considered the center of the entire world. Michelangelo walked these streets. So did Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, and the richest man in all of Europe. These streets are so steeped in stories, you can stroll up a hill and see Galileo's house. Yes, his actual house. Or step into a museum and see Galileo's finger. Yes, his actual finger. This is the city where art for its own sake was reborn the city Michelangelo called home. In his teenage years, Michelangelo was apprenticed to a painter named Domenico Ghirlandaio. Most art back then was created by studios. The way things worked is a master would have a school with a group of apprentices of various levels, some pretty advanced with the young ones doing the grunt work and picking up dirty little scraps of discarded knowledge off the floor. This is the church of Santa Maria Novella in Florence home of one of Ghirlandaio's big projects. Inside, front and center, you'll find a place called the Tornabuoni Chapel, a space Ghirlandaio was commissioned to paint. This is one of the places where Michelangelo was educated in the craft of creating frescoes, the rapid and delicate method of painting on wet plaster. But this was the late 1400s. This was the Renaissance. Artists were beginning to see themselves as individuals inspired by a passion for art, rather than mere contractors hired to carry out a task. Kind of like this guy who's going, get away from me, this is my art. He's cute and he's fluffy and I won't let you change him. So people like Ghirlandaio ran large studios, sometimes cranking out pieces like a sweatshop. And if there's one thing Michelangelo hated, it was art sweatshops. Remember that temper I told you about? No, oh, it's coming. So there was a system. This Tornabuoni Chapel was commissioned by a rich dude, Giovanni Tornabuoni. Yeah, that's right, it's named after him. This wasn't always done out of the goodness of their hearts. This picture of Tornabuoni? Yeah, it's in his chapel. The guy probably had pictures of these frescoes on his 16th century Tinder account. So Ghirlandaio would be assigned certain topics. In this case, scenes from the lives of Mary and John the Baptist. He'd do the primary design work and his students would help carry out his plan, and he's not really gonna deviate from that. Now, I'm not saying he didn't have some artistic license, nor am I saying these frescoes aren't impressive. There's nice shading and great perspective, which was a hallmark of the Renaissance. There's a reason I'm letting you look at them as they are instead of putting a bunch of nonsense flying around on the screen to hold your attention. But it was rather regimented, even down to the composition of the scenes themselves. The point is this, as impressive as this art may be, and it certainly is impressive, this was exactly the kind of thing Michelangelo hated. Rigid designs, specific expectations, limited freedom. In some ways, it was here that Michelangelo's raging fury was born.
there's some on these streets who would have called Michelangelo a bit of a, well, I'm not sure I'm allowed to say that word here, so let's just call him a Richard, and you can fill in the nickname for yourself. Now, I'm not calling him a Richard, but some could. He was talented, and he knew it. He had a biting wit and a bit of a chip on his shoulder. Get it? Chip on his shoulder? Because, eh, never mind. And look, this is a guy known for creating this, and this, and this, and painting this. I think he was entitled to think a bit highly of himself. Want to hear some stories? So I've got stories. And they all help explain how this mysterious missing mass came to be. Once, a young Michelangelo mouthed off to a fellow student who punched him in the face, resulting in a severely broken nose that was bent for the rest of his life. And Michelangelo would later talk a bit of trash about his old master Ghirlandaio, saying he, quote, received absolutely no assistance from him and claimed that Ghirlandaio was jealous of his talent. This was so controversial that even Giorgio Vasari, a man who wrote a ridiculously over-the-top biography praising Michelangelo, tried to set the record straight. Michelangelo's temper would follow him around throughout his life. He feuded with da Vinci, embarrassing Leonardo by calling him out for never finishing a giant equestrian statue for the Duke of Milan after he felt da Vinci was making fun of him. He feuded with Raphael, who ran a giant studio, one of those things Michelangelo hated. He feuded with Bramante, the Pope's chief architect. And yes, he even feuded with the Pope himself, after the Pope stiffed him when Michelangelo fronted the cash for some blocks of marble. The same Pope who basically forced him to use his fresco skills to paint an entire ceiling. And speaking of that ceiling inside the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo was trying to keep his daily work a secret. He poured everything into his art and was paranoid about people stealing his designs. Just down the hall, Raphael was painting this, and someone supposedly sneaked him into the Sistine Chapel at night. Michelangelo flipped out and accused Raphael of ripping him off, which is arguably true. It kind of reminds me of when someone stole one of my pictures and reposted it on Reddit and got over 50,000 upvotes and didn't give me credit or anything. Then I found out that person stole it from another person who'd posted it on a website along with everything I wrote about it and... Wait, did I just compare this picture to the Sistine Chapel? Fine, forget I said anything. But if you take anything away from these stories, kind of like how those people took away my picture, it's this. Michelangelo didn't like painting, didn't like the system, and you better not cross him. So that teenager working as an apprentice was eager to move on. And when Lorenzo de' Medici came calling, he jumped. This is Lorenzo de' Medici, a man known for his immense wealth and patronage of artists. Not his looks. Or his haircut. Actually, there's a show on Netflix where Lorenzo looks like this, which isn't exactly accurate. Now, Lorenzo was an incredibly wealthy banker. Like, really, really wealthy. Maybe the richest dude in Europe at the time. He and his family were basically the leaders of Florence. Lorenzo was dedicated to the arts with a deep desire to reconnect with the past and recreate the spirit of ancient Athens. It's like if Jeff Bezos actually tried to do something good with his cash. Here I've spent all this time ripping on these wealthy art patrons, like Tornabuoni, but it seems like Lorenzo was a bit different. He was actively encouraging artists to learn their craft and show off their creativity. Maybe Bezos shooting himself into space will be looked at as just to help everyone else? Yeah, I don't think so either. Keep in mind Lorenzo's grandfather, played by Rob Stark from Game of Thrones in that Netflix show, was a patron of Donatello, who'd created this bronze David, the first freestanding nude sculpture since ancient times. If you wanted to work for a family who'd give you free reign, this was the place to find them. To that end, Lorenzo wanted to train a new generation of sculptors, as there weren't many left. He set up a sculpture school in his garden and recruited an elderly student of the long-gone Donatello as a teacher. So Lorenzo goes to Ghirlandaio and asks for some of his best students. One of them was Michelangelo. Goodbye. 
So he's 15 years old, studying ancient sculptures. Remember, this is the Renaissance. They're digging up old statues, and people like Lorenzo are buying them to display in their homes. If you had enough money to get yourself one of those ancient statues, you were the popular kid on the block. Oh, this whole thing? Yeah, it's okay, I guess. I totally forgot I even had it on my Tinder account. Part of Michelangelo's process wasn't just examining ancient sculptures, but trying to copy them in order to learn technique. So he's working in Lorenzo's garden with the other students, copying the head of a fawn, a man with a goat head from Roman mythology. A creepy goat head. <laughs> Don't tell me fawns aren't creepy, because they definitely are. As the story goes, the ancient sculpture he was copying had its mouth closed, but Michelangelo made his with the mouth open. Lorenzo walks by, takes a look, and compliments the head. He tells Michelangelo it's great, but the teeth wouldn't be in such good condition. After all, this isn't just a creepy goat man's head, it's an old creepy goat man's head. This from Giorgio Vasari in that biography. This lord, laughing with pleasure as was his custom, said to him, but you should have known that old men never have all of their teeth and that some of them are always missing. You're probably thinking back on the feuds right now, and I wouldn't blame you. You're thinking of that boiling temper and imagining Michelangelo having a Chernobyl-style meltdown on Lorenzo. But we have to keep one thing in mind. With a few exceptions, Michelangelo lost his temper when he was right. It's likely that Leonardo was making fun of him. Bramante probably was badmouthing him to the Pope. The Pope did ignore Michelangelo's marble invoices. And as for Raphael, well, after seeing this in the Sistine Chapel, his next project was painting this. So, yeah. And in that garden, Lorenzo was right. Creepy old goat men do look different. Plus, Michelangelo actually respected the man, and he probably wanted to show up that other student who punched him in the face. So, no nuclear fallout. But Michelangelo did act swiftly and showed off his talent. He immediately breaks out a tooth and drills a hole in the gums to make it look like it had been extracted. Lorenzo is so impressed by this boy, he invites Michelangelo to live with him in his home. And I can't stress how important this was. Lorenzo was the most important guy in what's essentially the center of the world, the city of Florence. Also known as Firenze, and please leave a comment if you're Italian and think I should be allowed to call it Firenze. Or like and subscribe if you're not Italian and think I need to shut up and stop asking. So Lorenzo asks Michelangelo to move in and live with his children, almost as a son. Michelangelo's dad agrees, knowing what this would mean for his kids' education and earning potential. This sculpture and this moment were absolutely pivotal. The sculpture known as the head of a fawn eventually winds up here, in the Bargello famous sculpture museum of Florence. Alongside Donatello's Bronze David, as well as other pieces by Michelangelo, like this one of a drunken Bacchus. Totally safe, totally sound. Nothing's ever gonna happen to it here. Right? Hitler was a huge loser. At everything. This is the town of Linz in Austria one of the places Lil Hitler grew up. Yeah, that's him, probably looking a bit standoffish after having to run away from time travelers every other day. Hitler's dad, another loser, had a career in civil service, and he wanted his son to follow in his footsteps. But you see, Lil Hitler had big dreams. Young Hitler decided he was extraordinarily talented and applied to the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna, where he is rejected. He applies again and is rejected again. Hitler wrote about this in his book, Mein Kampf, which translates to my struggle and also translates to poor me, I'm such a victim and everyone's out to get me and nothing's my fault or my country's fault. It's all the fault of the communists and the Jews. They're to blame for everything. He says, quote, I was so convinced I would be successful that when I received my rejection, it struck me as a bolt from the blue. And look, I'm no art critic, but some of this does seem a bit off, especially when he tries to paint people. Like this one of Mary and baby Jesus. A very, very, very white Mary and baby Jesus. Even in an artistic world that embraced creativity, a world built by people like Michelangelo, <laughs> 
Hitler just couldn't hack it. The divergence here is striking. Instead of being invited to become an art student and eventually pursued by popes for his artistic talent, Hitler's told, uh, this is kind of a renowned art school, so I don't know, maybe go become an architect or something. Anyway, after being rejected, Hitler bums around Vienna. And I do mean bums. Like, he's literally homeless for a while. He tries to make money by selling paintings, including little postcards he'd sell to tourists, which may or may not have been copied from other postcards. It's around this time that he supposedly first becomes exposed to German nationalism and anti-Semitism. And you know the rest. Oh, God. As we all know, Hitler threw one of the largest temper tantrums in the history of our planet, stomping across Europe in an attempt to prove he's not a failure at all, and he's actually a big boy. Part of this involved teaming up with Italian dictator Benito Mussolini, another noted loser. It was the culmination of a long courtship. You're the man, you're the man! You're embarrassing me. No, really. Okay, I'm the man. And of course, Mussolini wanted to show off Italy's treasures. The historic streets of Florence were desecrated with swastikas as Hitler was enticed with art and architecture. Hitler was probably not on drugs at this point, although it's well documented that he gave meth to his troops and his doctors were pumping him full of all sorts of drugs, including meth. Supposedly the drugs came later, but here's Hitler acting really odd at the 1936 Olympics in Berlin. The same Olympics where his supposed master race was severely embarrassed when Jesse Owens, a black American, won four gold medals. Yeah, I know this is all a bit off topic, but I like to think Hitler's addictions began as a way to console his sorrow at being a failed artist. Anyway, back to Hitler's visit, which surely made the historical figures of Florence ill. He and Mussolini cross the river above the Ponte Vecchio and take in the sights at the Uffizi Gallery, where Hitler supposedly swooned at the majesty of its artistic treasures. <laughs> they then make their way to the Palazzo Vecchio and step out on a balcony just feet from the replica of Michelangelo's David. <laughs> Next is a lavish state dinner at the old home of Lorenzo de' Medici. <laughs> A couple of years later, Mussolini officially ties the knot with Hitler, then finds out you should never bet on a loser. The Allies invade Sicily and Mussolini is arrested. Things get a bit complicated here, but what you need to know is this. The Nazis move in and occupy Florence. Now, steps had already been taken to protect the city's artistic treasures from the dangers of war. Michelangelo's David was encased in bricks just in case of an errant bomb. Items small enough to be moved were taken to the countryside for safekeeping. The Allies took great steps to avoid bombing historical buildings in Florence, but more items were evacuated in 1942 as bombing runs escalated, including those in the Uffizi and the Bargello, which went to a place called the Castle of Poppy. The Allies began charging north through Italy in 1944, and some of the Italians in Florence got fed up with the Nazis, who promptly turned tail and ran, as losers tend to do. According to a group called the Monuments Men and Women Foundation, the Nazis stopped at the Castle of Poppy on their way out, claiming they were checking for hidden weapons. The German 305th Infantry returned a few days later, breaking down walls and doors, running off with crates of art in the middle of the night. Two Nazi lieutenants later told the Italians they were oh so very sorry, but orders came from up on high that they were to save pieces of art from those evil allies. Nearly 200 pieces were taken, though the Nazis, being eternally stupid, inexplicably left behind Botticelli's Birth of Venus and Michelangelo's Doni Madonna. One of the items they did take? The head of a fawn. The head of a fawn wasn't the only piece of art stolen by Nazis. Not by a long shot. As the war came to an end, the extent of their theft became clear. An estimated 650,000 pieces pillaged from all across Europe, the largest displacement of art in the history of human civilization.
Of course, losers rarely accept that they're losers. And for this loser, that meant surely the problem wasn't him. The problem had to be those mean old men who'd rejected him from art school. So despite his career change, Hitler still fancied himself a cultured connoisseur of art. And in his book about how unfair everything is, he went on rants about how he found modern art repulsive. It represented everything oh so very wrong with the world. You see, Hitler knew best, and he said this kind of art was sick. It was twisted. He told crowds that presented deformed idiots as representatives of manly strength. This art just wasn't German. This art was bringing about the downfall of civilization. He called this Entatete Kunst, degenerate art. In a sense, I guess you could say Hitler might have felt more at home in a time before the Renaissance, before the rise of unbridled artistic expression. And as he amassed power, he began seizing property from Jews across Europe, including their art. Much of this, along with art from museums Hitler just didn't approve of, was put on display in degenerate art exhibitions. I know this sounds made up, but this was real, with posters and programs and everything. The point was to show the bad art and contrast it with all the great art Hitler respected. Now, we've all heard of the infamous Nazi book burnings, where they set fire to books the regime didn't approve of. Well, they did the same to a lot of this art as well. Because nothing brings people together and makes them feel special, like uniting around things they don't like. But of course, there was the art Hitler did like, and this was stolen by the truckload. The famed Ghent altarpiece, considered to be the world's first major oil painting, vanished. The Lady with an Ermine, painted for the Duke of Milan by Leonardo da Vinci, poached from Poland. The portrait of a young man, believed to be a self-portrait by Raphael, gone. And from a church in Belgium, the Bruges Madonna, a delicate sculpture of Mary and baby Jesus, by none other than Michelangelo Buonarroti. Some was just hoarded or sold, but there were two other purposes. Some went to the collection of Hermann Goering, the number two Nazi and number two loser. And the other purpose was this, Hitler's planned museum called the Führer Museum, which was to be built in, where else, but the town of Linz in Austria. Supposedly, a lot of the art bound for this spot was actually paid for by Hitler, albeit at bargain basement prices. As for what happened to all the art stolen by the Nazis, that involves what's known as the MFAA, the Monuments, Fine Arts, and Archives Program, better known as the Monuments Men, established by the Allies to protect cultural treasures during the war. Remember how I said the Allies tried to avoid bombing historical sites in Florence? That was thanks in part to maps provided by the Monuments Men. And as the Nazis were pushed back, they raided sites where art was taken for safekeeping, like the Castle of Poppy. The stolen art was later stashed all over Europe. Any home, any room, any place at all could hide the cultural history of a continent. In towns like this one, San Leonardo, north of Venice in the Italian Alps. There, behind a locked door in an old abandoned jail. The treasures of Florence, stolen by those who thought they had the right. Medieval paintings, paintings from the Renaissance, just a handful of items from the Uffizi Gallery. Just a handful of items spread out over 1,500 sites, some as small as this jail and some as large as salt mines. Here's General Bradley, General Patton, and General Dwight D. Eisenhower himself inspecting some of the stolen art in one mine, also filled with mounds of Nazi gold. And here's another mine with stacks and stacks and stacks of stolen art, including some pieces you might recognize, like the Ghent altarpiece, which was then covered in tissue paper to prevent the paint from flaking off. And here's art from Goering's personal collection being recovered, with help from the 101st Airborne Division. And here's Da Vinci's Lady with an Ermine, found and unharmed. And here's Michelangelo's Bruges Madonna, wrapped up and kept safe on its trip back above ground. But amid all this priceless art, stolen by a man who simply wasn't good enough to make his own, some items were never found including 
the head of a fawn. In a symbolic gesture, American troops destroy the Nazi party emblem. When the war came to an end, Hitler wasn't simply facing invasion from the West. The Soviets came at the Nazis from the East, and they made it to Berlin first. After brawling through the streets, they took control of the city's bombed-out remains. As was the case with the Allies in the West, the Soviets also came across hidden archives of stolen art. And the Soviets were mad. I mean, most everyone was mad at the Nazis, but the Soviets lost around 27 million people in the fighting. So what they found, they kept. In their minds, it was simply reparations for their losses. Spoils of war. And it's not like anyone could ask Hitler where the head of a fawn was. Why? Because he hid at a bunker where he finally succeeded at something in his life when he took out Hitler. Nor is it like the Nazis categorized and tracked all their stolen art. Items could simply be snatched up and stashed by random soldiers. And in all fairness, this happened in the West as well. The Monuments men were constantly aware of the possibility of Allied troops grabbing stuff to take home as souvenirs. So where's the head of a fawn now? There's a number of possibilities, and it could have just been destroyed. It's not like buildings were exactly safe places to be as the Russians roared towards Berlin. And there's a chance the Nazis could have intentionally blown it up themselves. One of the mines in the West that was packed with stolen art was actually rigged with explosives. So is it possible it's gone forever? Sure. And it's also possible some random soldier tucked it under his coat and it's hidden in some moldy chest in someone's basement right this second. Just as it's possible it's hanging on a wall somewhere in Moscow. After all, a massive amount of art stolen by Hitler still hasn't been found. The items continue to surface even now, misplaced, misidentified, or kept in the care of those who never should have had it to begin with. And to be perfectly honest, no one knows for sure what the head of a fawn really looks like. There's two plaster casts traced back to the original, both currently located in Florence. There's a few experts who believe these didn't come from the original, and at least one expert says there never was a head of a fawn at all, that Michelangelo was a huge Richard and just made the whole story up. And look, frankly, compared to other works by Michelangelo, the head of a fawn isn't exactly the height of artistic glory. Nor is it necessarily the most valuable piece of art still missing from World War II. That honor likely goes to Michelangelo's friend, Raphael, whose portrait of a young man is valued at around a hundred million dollars. But the head of a fawn still tells a tale. It highlights a critical part of the life of one of mankind's most acclaimed artists, a piece that kicked off an entirely new life for a young Michelangelo Buonarroti. So it certainly has value, which is why the Monuments Men and Women Foundation counts it as one of the most sought after pieces of stolen art and is offering a reward of up to $15,000 for information that leads to its recovery. But amid all this talk of thievery and failure, this talk of loss and destruction, maybe we should just try to focus on one thing we got right. Because even beneath the fog of war, not everyone stole. Not everyone kept what they discovered. The Monuments Men took what they found to central collection points, one of which they set up in the former Nazi party offices in Munich, where everything was sorted, cataloged, and photographed. As best as they were able, they took that stolen art and sent it back to where it came from. And although the head of a fawn wasn't among what they recovered, this included truckloads of art delivered back to Florence, back to what was once the center of the entire world. Truckloads of art driven right through the same square where Hitler stood near the replica of Michelangelo's David, not too far from the church of Santa Croce the church where the tomb of Michelangelo himself now sits in a place of honor. Truckloads of art taken back to where it belongs, inside a museum. Because if there's one lesson we can learn from this story, some things simply shouldn't belong to anyone. Some things belong to us all and should be kept where they can be seen, where they can be appreciated, so those who made them 
those who poured their entire beings into their art can be remembered.